All right, good morning. How are we doing today? I think beginnings are really important, how you start out. We always want to make a good first impression on people when we meet them, right? I saw a thing on the internet today that was a a young woman meeting uh, her boyfriend's parents for the first time, and she's like, hi, how are y'all doing? And they're like, we're good. And then they kind of awkwardly stare at each other for a minute. She's like, I usually don't make it this far, so I don't really know what to do next. (laughs) So beginnings are really important, and we talk about in the video just then, you saw... Uh, the beginnings of a movement. Acts is this beginning of a movement. We're moving forward. And last week we talked about the uh, plan of the church, or sorry, the purpose of the church, what we're doing, uh, what, we're, what we're about, what's our purpose. We're, we're here to glorify God, and we're here to glorify God by making disciples. And how you start is incredibly important. We want to start well. We want to get off to a good start. And uh, my wife and I, this past uh, couple weeks, sorry, uh, we've we're, we're kind of been remodeling our patio area because for some odd reason we've spent a bunch of time outside in the last year, so we felt like, hey, we should have a nice outside area, right? So uh, we got a grill, like a nice propane grill. Hank Hill would be really proud of us. We got a propane grill. And uh, we've got this, like, like, putting it all together, and the grill was really, really easy to put together. The cart, on the other hand, was a nightmare. So my wife said she was going to go up to Lowe's to pick up a grill. Now, if you've ever been to Lowe's or Home Depot, there's like grills like right outside, like just tons of them assembled, like just put them in your car. So I think in my head, oh, she's picking up an already assembled grill. No, no. Pick up the assembled grill. Just, if you don't get anything else out of today, pick up the assembled grill. (laughs) Really will help you. And so this cart, I promise you, we put it together every single which way you could put it together except for the way that it was needed. And we finally got the grill all assembled and realized that the attachment for the propane tank was on one side and the holder was on the other side. So we have to strip it all back down. It took us four hours to put a grill together. How you start is important. The cart was the most important part. How you start is so important. And all of us want to start well. But some of us don't know where to start. When it comes to following Jesus, when it comes to making disciples, we don't know where to begin. We don't have a plan. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about the plan of the church, what the church is supposed to be doing and how we're going to go about doing it. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 26, and we're going to see, we're going to serve, and we're going to speak. And the key thing I want you to hear today is that right where you are, right where you are is where you need to start. So let's talk about seeing people, seeing them right where they are. Verse 1 of chapter 3, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of, the entering, of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Now, this is after Pentecost. So the power of the Holy Spirit has descended on the church, and and they're full of the Spirit. They're in community. They're they're giving to one another. They're sharing. They're praying. They're devoted to each other. And the apostles are on their way up to the temple, which I think is incredibly strange. And we'll talk about why I think that's strange in a little bit. Uh, But on their way up, they see this man who has been born uh, with a disability from birth. Now, it doesn't say what the disability is. Later on, it's going to talk about his feet and ankles being strengthened, and Luke being a doctor and also the author of this book, I'm assuming that there was something wrong with his feet from the ankles down perhaps some kind of deformity uh, in, the, in the ankles that he couldn't stand. And so every day, his family or his friends would bring him to the gate uh, called Beautiful, and he would lay there and he would beg for money. And that's how he supported himself, and that's how he maybe contributed to his family and his community. That's what he did. And on top of that, everybody would see him. He'd probably be a group of beggars at each gate, all of them kind of fading into the scenery that is your travels up to the temple. Now, we know the disciples have been up to the temple many times. In the book of John, they go up at least three times with Jesus, and it appears to be a regular occurrence that they're going up to the temple to pray. So they probably go in and out this gate all the time. And I don't know how much you know about the way that your brain works, but when you see the same things over and over and over again, your brain can't process all the information that your eyes, ears, and senses take in, and so your brain makes decisions that you don't make, sort of, that you don't make consciously, What's important and what's not? So for instance, right now, you're focused on me. You're not paying attention to what everybody else is wearing, and if you are, get your mind right. (laughs) Let's focus up. You're not paying attention to where everybody else is sitting. 
You're focused on me or you're thinking about where you're gonna go for lunch. Both are acceptable. Your brain is making decisions like that all the time. And so the disciples, you would think, as they're going up to the temple, are just like, and there's the beggar, and we see him all the time, and, and, but they don't. They don't ignore him. Maybe they have in the past, but they don't right now, and they engage with him, right? They say, look at us, and he looks back at them, and there's this moment, this very intense moment, it feels like. This man doesn't just fade into the background. And, and I really think it's incredibly possible for him to have faded back into the background. Think again about where the disciples are going and this time in their lives. They're going up to the temple. The temple is the seat of religious power in Jerusalem, which means that the guys that put in motion the plan to kill Jesus, that's where they work. That's like where they're at. So if you're going up to the temple and you're a follower of Jesus, you're probably like, all right, let's concentrate on keeping our head down. Peter, don't say anything dumb, bro. Like, you have a tendency Let's just keep it on the down low. Or maybe they're thinking about how they're actually going to proclaim the gospel. Maybe they're focused on the words that they're gonna say. They're like, okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. And so they're not noticing the scenery around them. They're not noticing the people as they pass by. Or maybe they're just focused on being religious. They're going up to the temple. We're gonna pray. I wanna have my heart right before God and I'm gonna be focused right here on what God wants me to do and I'm gonna focus on him. But that's not what they do. They notice this man. And the reason why they notice this man it's not because Peter and John are super special. It's because the spirit of God has poured, been poured out on them and they have now opened up with the heart of love that Jesus Christ has for everybody. This is the kind of person that Jesus would notice that nobody else does. And all of a sudden, Peter and John are like, hey, that's the important person. That's the person we need to focus on right now. We are surrounded at all times by things, whether it's, it's by training or by repetition or by busyness, things that we ignore. We think of them as distractions. We think of them as, as, as uh, things that are misleading us from what we're supposed to be. What if, what if some of the things that we see so regularly, whether it's our family members, whether it's our friends, our coworkers, uh, the people in our neighborhood that we pass all the time, what if the people we pass on our way to the mission are actually the mission? What if they're the whole purpose? What if the distractions that you see in your life are actually the whole reason you were put on earth what if that's the most important thing? What if the things that you think are irrelevant are actually the most relevant things in the world to the mission and the purpose of God? So how do we do this? How do we retrain ourselves? How do I get my, my stupid old brain to stop ignoring things that are actually really important? Well, one, you need to stop right where you are. Look back at verse four. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Now, admittedly, it doesn't say they stopped. But I kind of have a hard time reading this as a drive-by healing. I just don't see that's what's going on. It seems very intense, very focused, very intentional. They stop and they engage this man. They slow down. Y'all, we have got to slow down. One of the, the, the blessings, one of the few blessings of the whole COVID situation has been many of us have been forced to stop and slow down, right? Right? been stuck at home for a while and then maybe you're picking things back up. That's been a, that, that has, while, while COVID itself is not good, it's been a nice side effect. Except for some of us are like dying. You're like chomping at the bit, being like, please let me out of here. Slowing down is a really good and godly thing to do. We are entirely too busy as a culture. We are uncomfortable with silence. We're uncomfortable with, with not having a plan. Some of us, if every single moment of our agenda is not filled up, we think that's wasted time. That is not the life of Christ. Christ likes to work in those moments that are open. If we're gonna start seeing the world the way that God sees it, we've gotta slow down. We've gotta slow down. This may mean cutting out some things, removing some things from our life, because here's the thing. The reason why God doesn't have to slow down is because he's omnipotent and he's outside of time. He can see all things at once. Newsflash, you are not outside of time. <laughs> you might be out of time, but you're not outside of it. We are not able to see all things at once, so we have to slow down so that we can process what's important and what's not. Slow down. We also need to look right where we are. Look how many times the word look is in these, first, uh, these two verses. Uh, verse four again, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. 
and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Four times in two verses, people are like looking at each other. This is like a very intense moment. There'd be like music playing if this was a movie. There's a lot of looking going on. When you change environments every day, whether you're going from home to work, work to home, home to school, home to practice, home to whatever, wherever you're changing venue, maybe you're going into a a new room for a meeting or you're starting a Zoom meeting or whatever it is that you're doing, that change of environment should be a little trigger in your brain. If you're gonna start stopping where you are and seeing people where they are, if you're gonna do that, Those little changes in sceneries need to be little notifications for you. Like, oh, I need to look around. Who's here? Who's somebody that I usually ignore? Maybe there's a a temp that works there, works at your work, or there's an intern, or maybe there's there's somebody that you know uh, you've heard has been going through a hard time, but you haven't really engaged with them. Look around where you're at and see people. See the people that you usually ignore. Your servants, uh, servers at restaurants. People that we typically ignore. The church has been built by bringing people into the fold, into the body of Christ, people that we typically ignore. It's not always the rich, it's not always the elite. Usually it's the people that are ignored and cast off. Jesus tells us, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden and I'll give you rest because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Who around you needs to be brought to Jesus? Who would be really refreshed by that message? It's probably not the people that you think you're seeing all the time. It's probably somebody you ignore. And I don't think it's like a malicious kind of ignoring. We're just busy. I think we seek God's wisdom and we seek God to open our eyes just as he opened Peter and John's. And then we have the courage to act. So what do we do then? After we notice people, after we see them, what do we do? Well, we serve them. Look at verse six. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took, them, took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Peter doesn't give this man anything other than the blessing of being able to walk, which is a pretty big blessing. You know what I think is amazing about this miracle? Now, again, I'm not a doctor, okay? But what I think is amazing about this miracle is this man was born this way, which means he has never walked. Now, again, I understand enough, I think, about physiology to know that if you haven't used muscles your entire life, they do this really nasty thing called atrophy, which means that they're not really able to do some things. If he's laid on his back or on his side his entire life, his legs, his calves, his thighs, they wouldn't be able to support him. On top of that, if he hasn't ever walked in his life, his brain probably needs to learn how to work those body parts that he's never used. This man needs physical therapy. Apparently not. Because the miracle that God works in his life is so thorough, it doesn't just heal and strengthen the legs, I think it actually puts like meat on the bones. I think it actually like teaches his brain the 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 synapses work. Again, I don't know neurology at this point, we're we're way out of my league, but something happens to where this man is not only able to like stumble around, he is running, leaping, jumping, which are all things that at 37 I no longer can do. This is amazing. This is amazing. All because Peter and John stopped to serve him. Stopped to serve him right where they're at. Now, if you're like me, you're probably sitting there being like, well, Travis, I'm probably not going to be able to make anybody walk. I mean, I'm not a medical professional, and I'm certainly not a miracle worker. Look, I get that. I I read this passage, and I'm like, "Eh, I I don't know what I would do for this man. I think through the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't want to rule out miracles ever. Uh, At the same time, uh, I think prayer and laying the hands on people I think is really important to do and and really good, and we should do those things. We'll talk about that a little bit, I think, next week. Uh, But what what I I don't feel like I have uh, the authority necessarily to do, unless I really hear from the Lord, is like to tell somebody that can't walk to get up and walk. So like, what do I do? How do I serve people right where I'm at? Well, one, I can serve by listening. 
and serve by listening. Now, what's funny about this passage is Peter and John don't do a whole lot of listening, which isn't really, it's like par for the course for Peter. They don't really do a whole lot of listening in this passage. But it's so blatantly obvious what this man needs. I can give this man a coin, or I can get him up and get him walking, and he can take care of himself from here on out. It's the whole, like, give a man a fish or teach a man to fish, right? That's what Peter does. He listens to what this man's most deep-seated need is, and he gives it to him. He hears him. He gives to him. Oftentimes, we're not worried so much about what people need or what people want. We're more concerned what we think they need or want. Does that make sense? Because we don't listen. We don't like to listen. Because it makes us lose control of the situation, of the conversation that we're in. We also tend to be doers. We're fixers. We come from an affluent part of the world. And I don't just mean North Dallas. We live in America. Most of what we consider to be minimum wage is, is way over what, what people in other countries make. And because we tend to be wealthier, we think that we can fix everything. Saw a video this week. Apparently, I've been watching a lot of videos. Um, so I saw a video this week of a contractor. And he was uh, doing demo on a, on a bathroom. And so he had ripped out the tile in the bathroom and he was walking you through kind of what he had been doing. Uh, and, and while he's walking through this, uh, this woman walks in who I assume is the owner of the home and she starts freaking out, screaming and, and calling this man all sorts of names. You idiot, you idiot. This is the wrong bathroom. <laughs> now again, any self-respecting contractor, I feel like why would you post that on the internet? Like everybody knows now you're incompetent uh, or at least that you made a mistake. But it's really funny. She's like, going after him because he was fixing the wrong bathroom. So many of us are trying to remodel the wrong bathrooms in people's lives. We're not listening. We want to convince people of their political errors, their, their theological errors, their doctrinal errors, their moral errors. You shouldn't sleep with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever. Rather than recognizing that the thing they need fixed in their life is something you actually can't fix. They need the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They need the presence of God in their lives. They need Jesus Christ and that's the part of their life they need fixed. And the only way you're going to fix that is by serving them and speaking to them. We need to serve people. We need to listen to what they need. But we also need to serve by helping. Look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And so Peter doesn't just speak to the guy. Again, Peter's very active, right? I can't think of a time when Jesus like helped somebody up. I'm pretty sure Jesus just, just like spoke to people. But Peter's like, hey man, let me give you a hand here. You ain't... Want... Pulls him right up. There's a lot of people around us that need, like, help up, right? Now, you might not be the one through whom the miracle comes. You might not be the person uh, who signs the big check that makes them uh, all financially uh, good for the rest. Like, you might not be that person. But you might be the person that helps them up, that helps them up, that reaches down and pulls them up. Think about the people around you, the people that we typically ignore, how can you help them up in the midst of what they're going through? Can you help them up by praying for them? One of the coolest things about being a follower of Christ is that most often the ways that we can help people up don't actually involve us doing anything other than listening to them and praying for them. Your reach can be very, very long if you would pray for people. Very, very long indeed. Can you help them with financial needs? Maybe. Materially, can you help them up with that? Can you help them up with their emotional needs? Maybe somebody just needs a non-judgmental, loving, kind friend to listen to them. And you're right there, right where you are. You can help them up. Maybe one of your kids needs helping up. Again, I think about this a lot. Like I, I see my kids running around in my house and wonder what sort of terrible damage there I'm doing to them by just me being their father. And I'm wondering if, that's not funny. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering how I can love them and encourage them and help them up when they're down or having a bad day. Look, however you decide to help people, I would encourage you to look back at what Peter says in verse six. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. What do you have and what can you give? It's not just about helping people right where you are. Look around at what you have right where you are. And be ready to give that. Hold it very loosely. Be ready to give whatever you have right where you are. Walk alongside them. That's listening. That's helping. 
That's praying, but it's not enough just to uh, see and to serve. We also need to speak. We need to speak to them. Uh, Verse 11, while he clung to Peter and John, that's the man who was just healed, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together with them into the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel. Now, before we get into what he says, I want you to pay attention to how absolutely offensive this would have been to everyone around him, okay? So verse uh, 12, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, i.e. we saw you do it. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, and so did your rulers. Wow. I'm going to finish today's uh, time with you by calling you all ignorant. That's how we're going to land this plane. Like, it's too rough. Peter and John are only a few chapters uh, removed from being very scared and very timid. The presence of the Holy Spirit is really the only thing you can account for. Their boldness. And they're quite bold. They equate Jesus' work with the work of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the fathers. Which is basically the same thing that got Jesus killed. Him equating himself with God. They say that they denied Jesus and how did they, they kill him? By working with the hated Romans. So you guys got together with the Gentiles and worked. We saw it. We saw it happen. You killed the one who created life. And instead of when he was offered back to you, instead of killing him, you instead took somebody that takes life rather than the one who gives life. He calls them and their rulers ignorant. And then at the very end of all this, uh, which we're not going to read today, but he says that Moses prophesied that there would be somebody that came after him, a prophet that would be greater than him. And y'all need to listen to him. And you didn't. You guys claimed to follow Moses and you didn't even listen to him when he said to look out for the guy that's going to come after me. I think is really interesting is that they go up to the temple to proclaim this message. Like, why there? I mean, I get it. You, you've been charged to make disciples, but why go into like the mouth of the beast right there? Like why go pick a fight? I mean, again, sounds very Peter, but like There are so many other places that you could have kept your head down. Why here? You know why I think it is? It's their Jerusalem. The temple is right where they are. That's the biggest concentration of their people there in that place. They know they can speak there. They know they can address people there. That temple is right where they are. And all the people know. All the people that they know, all of Israel is in that place. And this is such an amazing act of love by the disciples. Their best friend was killed. Their best friend was then raised to life. And you know what's interesting? There's not really any animosity from Peter and John. They're just stating facts. They're like, yeah, you killed this guy, but he's back now. And you have time. You have a chance to repent. We'll get to that in just a second. Peter says, let's go up there. John says, let's go up there and tell them how much God loves them. Where's your Jerusalem? We asked this last week, but really, like, Where is right where you are? Where is the place where you are? And where can you serve? Who do you have to share with? Maybe a roommate, maybe a friend, maybe a family member. Take time this week, maybe 15 minutes. Get together with the people you live with or people you work with that you know know the Lord and talk about, hey, what have you seen God do in your life this week? Share with each other. Your Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. Your Christian life is not private. It's personal, but it's not private. And those two things are very different. Secondly, there's a chance for these people. Look at verse 17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, but. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring of all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Here's why they decide to go up there, because there is still time for these people who killed Jesus to repent and turn back. Now, I don't know what you're going through today. 
I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but here's what I do know. If the message of hope and the gospel is for the very people who were in a crowd yelling for the King of Kings and the Lord of the Lords to be murdered, and there's hope of repentance, refreshment, and restoration from them, from the very person that they killed, guess what? I am 100% sure that that applies to me and you today as well. Because that's about as bad as it gets. I don't know what you're going through today, but I can tell you that I think most of us would really welcome a time of refreshment. And I'm not talking about lunch. A time of refreshment, a time of restoration, a time for the Holy Spirit to come in our lives and restore us. And we often ask God for these things while neglecting the first thing that he's talking about here, repentance. God's grace is big and mighty and powerful and he longs to draw close to you and give this refreshment and restoration to you. But he's gonna ask you to turn, to leave behind the things that you were doing formerly, to leave behind the things that are distracting you from him. And for those of you who aren't believers, I know this can sound really foreign to you, I get that. But I would encourage you, God's arms are wide open and he wants to offer you this refreshment, this restoration whether it's loneliness, whether it's brokenness, whether it's uh, addiction you're in, whatever it is, there is refreshment and he's calling to you. And, and not only is he gonna, gonna, gonna give you this, he's gonna give you the power to repent as well. And we'll talk about power next week. But there are people in your life that need to know that our God is a God of restoration and refreshment. Why would we withhold that from them? Why would we not tell them about him? Why? The plan is really easy. Start where you are. Start where you are. See people right where you are. Serve them right where you are with right what you have. And then speak to them about what God's doing in your life. It's very simple. It might not be easy, but it's very simple. And each of us empowered with the Holy Spirit together can do this. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God because you don't stand far off. You don't, you don't treat us as if we're second-class citizens. You draw close to us and you desire to know us. And you desire to make us your sons and your daughters. And so, Lord God, I pray that for those of us here today that don't, don't know that they're your son or your daughter, don't feel that closeness, don't sense the work of you in their life, Lord, I pray that, that you would break through. Whatever it is that's blocking that, I pray that you would break through it and I pray that you would rescue them. Give them times of refreshment and restoration. And Lord, I pray that we would look around the world, look around our worlds, our little private worlds, the worlds that we, that we live in. I pray we would see people, we would serve them, and we'd speak to them about how great our God is. And it's in your name we pray, amen.